by 2007, Jimmy Kane is Chief Executive Chairman and he is 72 years old. And somebody comes up to him and says, Jimmy, two of our hedge funds are in trouble because of all this subprime stuff. It's gone bad. We don't quite know how bad, but we're thinking maybe two, three billion pounds we're up for uh, grabs here. So Jimmy, at this point, goes to Nashville to a bridge <laughs> tournament. Being 72 years old, he has resisted email and mobile phones. So he's out of contact. But he runs the bank. They go, the two hedge funds collapse. The guy who ran the hedge funds is now indicted for fraud. Okay? That's his current status. We, he, we don't know whether he's guilty or innocent, but he, that's the status. Later, March, 2007, March 2008 comes along and, and the whole Bear Stearns is looking bad. Jimmy, by this time, has relinquished CEO status. He's still chairman. So he goes to Detroit for another bridge tournament. <laughs> and during this time, the bank collapses and has to be rescued. If that you don't get bailed out if, you're an, if you have this non-regulated investment bank status. So who, now Bear Stearns is, is going down to the tune of 30 billion. <clears throat> what to do? Ben Bernanke, deep and liquid financial system, AME of the world, comes along and basically bails them out by getting JP Morgan to do the bailout and paying JP Morgan. JP Morgan is a conglomerate bank that is famous for its investment activities but, but is regulated because it takes people's deposits and therefore can be bailed out. She gives 30 billion to JP and JP gives the 30 billion to Jimmy Kane. Jimmy Kane uh, memorably seizes the microphone at the shareholders meeting and shouts, um, that which doesn't kill you makes you strong. Right now I feel like Hercules. And he takes away his, his 12 million pounds that he, and sells the shares the next day. And he, get, he gets out with some of his formerly 60 million, uh, 60 million uh, fortune. Why am I telling you this story? Because it created what the Americans call moral hazard. That is, you know, if a guy is playing with matches and burns his house down and claims the insurance, the insurance pays out once, if he does it again, they're not going to pay out. Because they believe there is a moral right, basically, to at some point saying, stop, just stop taking the mickey out of us. You are, you, you are creating a moral hazard. Now, the American government realised that, that the, the Jimmy Kane affair and the Bear Stearns, the Bear Stearns is the fourth biggest of the five <laughs> banks, had created moral hazard. It created the impression that if anybody else was foolish enough to crash a major bank while playing cars in Nashville, they too would be bailed out and take away their 12 million and feel the strongest Hercules. And so when Dick Fool, who's running Lehman, the fifth biggest bank, um, basically, to cut a long story short, miscalculates in, in, they're also screwed completely. So they go into the Korean state to try and get a bailout, miscalculates, walks away. The insiders on that bank were saying to me, you know, the guy, you know, was crackers. He just didn't understand. He was, he, he, <laughs> People who train them will say to you, I don't say anything about fraud, or, or, except that what his, his lieutenants have said, and that, that, that he fits into this category. I didn't meet the guy, but I do know people who train and coach senior bank executives, and they say a constant problem is this kind of narcissistic personality that believes what they say is true, whether it's true or not. And, and, and fraud exhibited many of these traits in the process of, of crashing Lehman. So he crashes Lehman, and Lehman goes to the American government, well, your bell burst turns out, what are you going to do? The American government says, you know, look, you know, this is it, you cannot do that. Wall Street has to bail you out. Wall Street must bail out Lehman. 30 billion can be raised by Wall Street. You've got to do it, guys, otherwise the system goes down. Wall Street walks away. Because they too, as we now know, are in deep trouble. The banks that did Right, on that weekend, I was there in, in, in New York, on the weekend, what happened? You, you know the story, Lehman goes for a bailout, everybody looks at Lehman, Bank of America, this giant conglomerate bank, one of the biggest banks in the world, if not the biggest, looks and says, well, we could bail them out, but they, they, they look like they're worth zero, so we're not going to. But Merrill Lynch has quietly come to us, in, you know, literally in the gents' toilet of the American, of the New York Federal Reserve, and said, we're screwed as well. Why don't you bail out us? So they do. Um, so now there's only two investment banks left, and they both rush immediately to be regulated. You know, the great deep and liquid financial system, the envy of the world, based on deregulation, suddenly nobody wants to be deregulated because everybody wants to be bailed out. 
That's the credit crunch. That's the Lehman. Two days later, AIG goes bust, the biggest insurer in the world. What have they been doing? Well, we know from the fact that they've been involved in criminal activity, criminal activity, uh, probably for decades. There's an interesting story about AIG. Um, inadvertently revealed before the crisis hit. I'll just simply tell it you, by the guy who used to be second in command. He said, look, when the Delaware regulators, all, all companies that want to be deregulated in America are regulated in Delaware. Okay? When the Delaware regulators got onto AIG in the late 90s and started sniffing around their business practices, practices that would later lead to them being, um, being uh, prosecuted, um, quotes, the boss, Morris, had Morris Greenberg, um, called in private detectives to sniff around into the private lives of the regulators. <laughs> and guess what? Nothing happened, regulatory-wise. Now, fast forward. The guy who takes them to court is called Elliot Spitzer. Uh -huh. He is a man who's made his name out of being the kind of hammer of Wall Street. He's already hammered them over dot-com. What, what happens to Elliot Spitzer one fine day, the FBI find that he is involved uh, in a prostitution ring uh, and is, for some reason, a tapped phone conversation emerges that he is a dirty guy and he loses his job. Um, funny, isn't it? Um, so anyway, AIG collapses on the Tuesday. Uh, by the Wednesday, there's a run on the American banks. By the Thursday, the top. Bernanke, deep and liquid, financial system envy of the world. Well, sorry, it's going down the tubes. What we have to do... We who have said for 20 years that the state has no role in society, no role in the economy, needs to be minimised, needs to be the silent policeman. Remember the theory, the theory that is there in Atlas Shrugged, in Ayn Rand's famous novel, that the best policeman in any two deal is one of the participants, not a third person called the state. Because the state or regulator can never know more than the two participants, and the two participants can make this thing work without a third party, as long as they're tough, as long as they are, as it says in Atlas Shrugged, you know, as they have no morality. They don't, they have no sentiment about each other, they're just tough with each other, and the tougher they are, and the more amoral they are, the better the system works. That's how it's supposed to work. That's why people like Dick Ford and Jimmy Kane end up running iconic corporations, because they're tough. Well, that system didn't work, right? It didn't work. These people did not obey their own instincts, they did not protect their own interests, they actually crashed major institutions. And instead of the state being irrelevant, it turned out that only the state stood between American capitalism and a complete collapse. So they come in with 700 billion of taxpayers' money, and you know the rest. So I'm going to just finish it, because I know Andrew's trying to wind me up, but I'm going to say, well, <laughs> what, what, what can we learn from this? Well, I think Alan Greenspan put it rather well. Let me just pull, pull this up. Greenspan puts it very well. Greenspan, of course, is the man who was an acolyte of Ayn Rand. <coughs> uh, again, one of the key arguers for the, the stateless capitalism, minimal state. Quotes, those of us who've looked to the self-interest of lending institutions to protect shareholders' equity, myself especially, are in a state of shocked disbelief. I made a mistake in presuming that the self-interest of banks and others were such that they were best capable of protecting their own shareholders. Your ideology, says the guy in the chair, has been challenged. He said, yes, I, it was working for 40 years, but it seems to have gone wrong. Well, that's basically what I conclude in the book. The neoliberal ideology put... was In the book, there's an account of how they did it. it, it did, they designed the world ruthlessly to reflect the interest of bankers. I don't think Margaret Thatcher had that in mind when she unleashed the free market thing. I think she had in mind some kind of world of entrepreneurs and grocers. You know, if you talk to a grocer about a bank now, you'll see how far we've come, even for the original uh, intention. Because, of course, there are no grocers, are there, because of Tesco and Sainsbury's. But, you know, you, you get the drift. You, the, the idea that it was all going to empower small, innovative, tiny capitalists went by the wayside. What it empowered was banks. Banks stood at the centre of the system, they creamed high profits in a low profit world, and then they crashed the system. And I think you have to say, without any value judgement or emotion, that that is the case. That is proof positive that that system doesn't work. 